Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I'm Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 Advisory Group. We are a collaboration among 70 or so organizations in Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the beginnings of American independence. And our guest today is a 20-year veteran of the world of Boston tourism and public history, Matthew Wilding, who is the Director of Education and Interpretation at Revolutionary Spaces. Great to see you, Matt. Thanks so much for having me, Bob. So uh, Revolutionary Spaces has a lot of interesting programs you're doing, commemorating things. You have this new exhibit, Impassioned Destruction on Politics, Vandalism, and the Boston Tea Party. Maybe we could start with that. Yeah, I would love to start with that. So uh, our new exhibit, uh, as you just mentioned, is called Impassioned Destruction. Uh, we decided to take kind of a new, t- uh, a new spin on telling the Boston Tea Party story. Uh, there are, you know, there are and have been, you know, dozens of, uh, exhibits uh, and interpretations of the Boston Tea Party throughout the city, uh, and they usually are about you know the the rebellion over over the Tea Act and uh, how it leads to the the American Revolution, which is a, an important story to tell. Uh, we decided to talk about it from, through kind of a more modern framing uh, about the act of vandalism and particularly the act of property destruction as a uh, way of protesting things. So we tell the story of the Boston Tea Party as it unfolds in its immediate aftermath. Uh, For some listeners who may not know, it was not super well received uh, in in the immediate Mm -hmm. aftermath. People like, you know, Ben Franklin and and George Washington are publicly denouncing it. Uh, And and it remains something of an embarrassment for a number of years until really the 1830s. It's kind of rebranded as the Boston Tea Party. Mm Uh, yeah, so it was called the destruction of the tea before that. It yeah. wasn't this happy event that we all agree was a great thing. Yeah, Right. And yeah, th- then you just kind of hit the main point, right, is our decision to agree that it was a great thing comes, you know, 40, 50 years, 60 yeah. years after the fact. Uh, and with that framing in mind, we decided to explore with the other half of the exhibit some other instances of, of property destruction in the name of protest, mm-hmm. uh, some of which uh, are not well received or well remembered, uh, and some of which are just kind of completely forgotten. Uh, so yep. we have instances like the Stamp Act Riot of 1765 here in Boston, the Ursuline Convent Fire, uh, which is when a group of, uh, of, of men in the 1830s raided the uh, the Ursuline Convent in Charlestown and burned it down. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Weather Underground's bombing of Gulf Tower in 1974. Mm -hmm. Um, The Reading Railroad strike uh, in uh, the uh, the late 19th century in Reading, Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. And of course, we we end it with January 6th, uh, which really in a lot of ways was the, the kind of seed of the exhibit and you, you and I actually talked about it when when, it, um, when I was kind of working on this exhibit because I wasn't totally sure how to frame it and I, I gotta say you were instrumental yeah. in, in some of my choices. Well yeah I, I think it's important and you're not saying boy the Tea Party was a good idea all of these things were good ideas you're just looking at this as a means of protest. Absolutely yeah we yeah. we actively did not take a side on any of it um, and yeah. we, you know, we tried to be as politically broad as we could, you know, the, uh, the weather underground is arguably the most successful, uh, mm. uh, radical leftist organization in American history. Uh, of course the, uh, the January 6th incident leans conservative or, or right wing, uh, the, the Ursuline convent fire is, is at its core in, in nativist and anti-Catholic action. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Reading railroad strike is a labor action. Uh, and the Stamp Act, very similarly to the T yeah. Act, is is a protest on taxes. So we took a broad brush, uh, and to your point, we really didn't want to say this is good. What we wanted to say is maybe you should consider whether or not you think the Tea Party is good. Uh, as, yeah, as a yeah. Right then. yeah. It does seem like the you know early on in the summer of 1773, when Jonathan Clark comes back, there's an attack on that Clark House, which looks very much like the Stamp Act riots, where they demolished Hutchinson's house, Oliver's warehouse, and so on. And it almost seems like after that, they're tearing the shingles off the house. Someone fires a gun from inside the house, and that disperses the mob. It seems like after that, the proponents of it decide to take a step back and not do that kind of destruction of property that they had done before to turn these guys into martyrs. That is not taking that step, even though, as you said, afterwards, Franklin Washington say, hey, this was really a bad idea. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the question as to whether or not 
protest in the form of any kind of violence, whether it be against property mm-hmm. or against human beings, yeah. is is a really in- intensely contested one throughout American oh, history, yeah. right right from the beginning. And yeah, you know, we have a we have a, another exhibit that opened uh, a few months prior that has a more traditional and socially acceptable form of protest. Uh, it's a history of petitions, uh, right? Yeah, the humble petitioner, petitioner. yeah. Right. And the humble petitioner is, is, is kind of another option of like, well, these people didn't have the right to vote. You know, it's a, it's mm. uh, black folks, women, uh, non-property owning men and, uh, and indigenous people. And so they used this tool that was legally at their disposal. Uh, but the, the question of what do I do when my voice is not heard um, mm. broadens itself pretty dramatically. If you, if you use all of the tools that you have at your disposal that are legal, certainly there are, you know, dozens of examples of petitions and letters and oh, requests yeah. to Parliament oh, yeah. to stop you know, what what is being perceived as unjust here in the colonies. Right. Yeah, and, and it comes up in the Declaration. I, we also, I think, discussed the tearing down of a baseball stadium. That is the yeah ritual destruction. In- yeah, in Pennsylvania, there's a there's a, destru- a destruction of a, of a park. Um, after I believe it's after the Athletics leave Philadelphia, but it may it may be, it may be the yeah. Phillies uh, moving to a new stadium. We we looked into it a little bit, and we just couldn't we couldn't find enough yeah. uh, like clear clear evidence of uh, of yeah. it being kind of planned. But yeah, it appears that yeah. you know people showed up at the stadium with with tools and dismantled yeah. it in protest. The final game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. And I first heard, I know I first heard about this. There was a presentation at the Mass Historical Society on this ritual house destruction in the 1760s, very learned paper. And at the end of it, Mary Maples Dunn, who is a very distinguished scholar, and her husband, Richard Dunn, I mean, two eminent scholars of early American history, then were probably in their 80s, were there. And I remember Mary Maples Dunn said, well, Richard and I participated in something very much like this. And they had gone to that game. And then she said, by the eighth and ninth inning, people were bringing out screwdrivers and things. And so her husband did not come. They were graduate students at the time, I guess at Penn. He had not come, someone loaned him a screwdriver so he could get one of these chairs out. She said it was this hatred about the owner. And so this Mm -hmm. dismantling of the stadium she saw in this tradition of the uh, protests of the 1760s. I guess you couldn't tar and feather whoever the owner of the the A's was, but uh, you could do something else. Yeah, you know, and I think you you just hit on the kind of opposite point uh, I'd made earlier about, you know, there's this long history of controversy about property destruction, but there's also, it's truly a tradition. And, it, you know, it, yeah. it goes beyond something as simple as a specific political worldview. And in many cases, like in this incident in baseball park, it even kind of jumps past politics. It's just a, it's oh, just yeah. a social action. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of politics is a social action. I mean, it was at one time, and maybe it still is. But, I mean, you and I don't get engaged in politics, so we wouldn't know this. But yeah, it's a uh, communal activity, and you're you're yeah. building a base and doing these other things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know Revolutionary Spaces. You manage two sites: the old South Meeting House and the old State House in Boston. And you've also launched a number of new tours of the surrounding area to kind of give a new perspective on what's happening outside. Yeah, um, so our, our tour season is done for the year, but we'll be back in the spring. Uh, we have two tours currently running uh, that I, I think are, are really exciting and kind of re reevaluations of downtown Boston. Uh, the first one we launched is called uh, Massacre in Memory, and we really lean into the... Um, the subject of a, one of our previous exhibits, which is still available online, uh, Reflecting Addicts, uh, that, you know, Christmas Addicts is one of the five victims of the Boston Massacre. Uh, also, of course, the first uh, Black and Indigenous man to die in the American Revolutionary, what becomes the American Revolutionary Movement. Um, and that framing uh, becomes an important narrative in the abolitionist movement in the 19th century, uh, particularly uh, as it's led by William Cooper Nell here in Boston. Mm-hmm. And as it turns out, the geography immediately surrounding our building lends itself to telling both of those stories kind of simultaneously. Um, you know, the massacre happens outside the old state house. Yeah. The orations and commemorations of the Boston massacre happen inside the old South Meeting House. Right. The um, the revival of those orations uh, by William Cooper Nell in the 19th century uh, happens in Fanel Hall. Uh, mm-hmm. The sold both the soldiers and um, 
uh, people who are being prosecuted under the Fugitive Slave Act are held in the same jail that used to be on the other side of Old State House. Right. They were right. tried in the same try the same court right, right next to the Old State House. It's incredible. Right. So yeah. getting to explore this downtown and like not the Freedom Trail mm -hmm. packaging, but but through a, right. a clear narrative that's that's hooked onto one thing was really fun. Um, the other uh, yeah. uh, the other the other tour uh, Boston reconsidered uh, explores the historical narrative of boston past the revolution uh right. we get to talk about you know the the both the abolitionist movement gay uh the gay rights movement um yeah. anarchist movements all kinds of movements that all have roots in death at boston so they're great tours yeah. i recommend them both great it's, it's a really such a great location one of the great things about boston is you can be on one site and just see these layers of history around mm -hmm. yeah i mean and really you know at a level that i think is not true at any other in any other city in America, I mean, Philadelphia makes a, a reasonable claim to it, but the 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 sheer volume of historical impact that happens within you know a square mile in downtown Boston with architecture that in many cases still exists uh, is, yeah, yeah. is just yeah. incredible. Um, yeah. And and even for the, some of the architecture that doesn't exist, uh, you get to talk about why it doesn't exist anymore, and that right. is that in itself yeah. is is fascinating. I mean. That there used to be a Hutchinson Street over near Post Office Square, uh, yeah. and then there, then there wasn't anymore. And why is right, that? Yeah. Is is just yeah. as interesting a story. That's actually been one of for me the most exciting parts about coming to revolutionary spaces and, and doing the work here is that for a long time I, I came from the Freedom Trail Foundation, um, as you know, uh, I was a tour guide mm -hmm. there, and then I was content director, and then I worked at the Kennedy Institute in Dorchester, uh, yeah. among other places. Uh, but when I came back to Rev Spaces, the the kind of the interest uh, among the general tourist tour guy, like you know, uh, historical tourism mm -hmm. public, changed pretty dramatically. Uh, and a lot of visitors mm -hmm. wanted to talk about things that weren't here anymore. Um, and the great the great hook for uh, a, a walking tour historically is uh, have something to point at, right? Whether it's a plaque yes, or a right. building, have yeah, something to yeah. point at. But the new framing of having something that's missing to point at and then talking about why it's not there anymore. Mm. Uh, that that's been a really fun uh, and kind of refreshing way to talk about things. And I think Hutchinson street is, is such a great example of that is, you know, when people bring really their hands is. about tearing down monuments and, you know, it was just in a, 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 a family event where family members were talking about tearing down monuments. And I was like, well, you know what? We um we've we've been we've been tearing down monuments for since the beginning. I mean, we 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 tore down all memory of of Thomas Hutchinson in public eye yeah. uh, after the American yeah. Revolution. There was a town named after him that's now called that's Barry. Right. Yeah. That's right, named for Isaac Barry, who yeah. comes up with the name Sons of Liberty. So. Right, right. Meanwhile, we are we you know, we erase the native the native political figure who we named the town after eleven years prior. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. The uh, son of Massachusetts. Sometimes you see in a book he was a British governor. He, oh, he was from here. His family yeah. had been here since the 1630s. There's a yeah. statue of his great great grandmother in front of the state house. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we're talking with Matt Wilding, who is the director of education and interpretation at Revolutionary Spaces, a long veteran of Boston's world of tourism public history. Now you mentioned being on the Freedom Trail and there you portrayed one of these great characters who also was erased at one time, Ebenezer McIntosh. Yeah, yeah, I got to play Ebenezer McIntosh for a long time uh, on the Freedom Trail. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite historical figures. Uh, for those who don't know, McIntosh was the leader of the South End Gang. Um, who uh, led um, riots on on what we call Pope Day, uh, November fifth, for all you um, uh, Beef for Vendetta fans. Uh, there's still Beef for Vendetta fans, right? That's still a thing. Uh, but uh, Macintosh uh, led these gangs uh, that built these effigies that had the Pope and political figures on them, and then they essentially fought members of the North End uh, yeah. for for victory. Uh, and yeah. those two these guys gangs, are all the same too, right? It's all these yeah. de demographically, politically, ideal. Yeah, they're mostly similar. working class kids. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they're fighting each other to prove, really, to prove which neighborhood's better. Uh, and right. my my, underst my understanding of that of those fights, um, which I'm sure you have some thoughts on too, but my understanding is that it's essentially sanctioned by the town so that they won't do it all the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like there's yeah. no police here, so they just need to let them let off steam and they give them, right. they give them a day a year. Once uh, a year they do this, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
but then the 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 re the redeployment of those gangs and particularly of Macintosh. Then um, the records of this are all so shoddy because it's all secret society mm -hmm. stuff, right? It's all Sons of Liberty yeah. uh, information. But it, what it appears to have happened is that somebody figures out a way to get these two gangs uh, who have been fighting each other for years to march together. Uh, and yeah. those, and they march behind Ebenezer McIntosh. Uh, and mm -hmm. and ultimately they you know they lead the stamp back riots in, in August of 1765, but they continue marching together you know well into the 17 the late 1760s. It's yeah. a, it's a really miraculous series of events where someone you know probably Samuel Adams, uh, but someone figures out a way to get to broker a peace between these two gangs uh, for political means, and they already essentially have military experience because they've been fighting each other for for right. years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean they're not in the Corps of Cadets. These are guys out in the street brawling with each other. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and and, and, you know, and they know they know the neighborhoods. They know their neighbors. Yeah. There's this great story about Macintosh uh, when he's arrested after the Stampback riots. Uh, he's held in the local jail, uh, and I believe it's Sheriff Greenleaf uh, tells protesters who show up uh, to disperse, uh, or he'll call out the militia. Yeah. And the people essentially we are say we are the militia. We are the militia. <laughs> yeah. Let them go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, it really is a shift of power. I mean, Gre the Greenleaf always has trouble then enforcing the law because he's um, the law is shifting. Under yeah, his and it really does does highlight the the kind of the vis the viscousness of 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 power, right? The 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 mm -hmm. the ability of a, someone like a sheriff to enforce the law has to do with whether or not he has anybody willing to enforce it. Uh, at a at a level that can beat the the public outcry against it, right. and I guess we still see that, right? I mean, again, with with January sixth, the willingness of of the government to suppress um, what is perceived at the moment as as a semi popular protest, uh, it you know was on full display. It was really hard to figure out whether or not whether or not police should be deployed um, to to stop it. Mm. Yeah. Now, McIntyre. Within weeks, it seems, of the destruction of the tea, he is exiled, or he goes off to exile in New Hampshire. I think it's, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's hard to see say whether or not he was like forced to leave, uh, yeah. or if he was just sort of priced out of the market. He ends up floating around all over the place. I believe he ends up walking to Ohio at one point too. At one time, yeah, he works like thirteen hundred. Yeah. He has a son out in Ohio. He walks out there. This is when he's in his sixties, just uh, yeah. taking that long walk out to Ohio and back. He, yeah, uh, there's actually a plaque to that, to the colony in Ohio, uh, right across the street yeah. from the state house on, uh, on right. State Street. That, yeah, like they, these people just essentially can't afford to live here anymore. So they, they yeah. it's another problem we can all identify with, right? So sure. a man can't yeah. afford to live yeah. in Boston anymore. Uh, so they moved to Ohio. Right well, now, it that, it, it, because, yeah, because he's on one of the, he's one of the guys who is on the list to like the, Hancock, Adams, uh, or John Rowe, and McIntosh, the ones mm -hmm. that the order comes, maybe these guys should be arrested. And uh, he's spirited. And it's unclear. Again, as he said, these are murky records. These are secret societies. We don't have anyone saying what's going to happen. But here is Ebenezer McIntosh. Is, uh, is it you know, the Patriot side or the Loyalist side that tells him, you know, that it would be better if he didn't come back? Or is it just as he yeah. could be priced out? Because he's a poor guy. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly it's not safe for him to live here during the occupation, but, but it's certainly, yeah. it, it appears that he leaves before the, uh, the, the second of our, uh, occupation of Boston. Um, yeah. And yeah, he, he also doesn't seem particularly welcome by the 1770s yeah. by people like John yeah. Hancock and Samuel Adams. Uh, he, yeah. you know, he'll go on to brag and suggest that he was deeply involved in things like the Boston Tea oh, yeah. Party, even yeah, though yeah. He, he very clearly is not here anymore by 1773. Yeah, yeah. So interesting character. I think uh, the Tea Party Ships and Museum says they just marked his grave up in, I think, Haverhill, New Hampshire, where he's buried. But it's the wrong name on the grave. It says Philip McIntosh. And uh, anyway, is there another, I've just been looking another grave? I may be wrong about this, but I, I think there may also be another grave in Vermont that that some people think is his. Uh, it could be Haverhill, Newbury, up on the Upper Connecticut were kind of twin twin towns up there, and he he seemed to bounce back and forth between them. I could yeah. be wrong. Um, anyway, we're talking about Matt Wilding. No, go on, Matt Wilding, Director of Education, Interpretation of Revolutionary Spaces. 
Yeah, I was just gonna say I hadn't uh, I haven't looked into the 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 most recent scholarship on where Emily yeah. Macintosh died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you've been doing other things, and you were more interested in Ebenezer Macintosh alive than death. Yeah, yeah, as a rioter, a fascinating figure, and and just just one who, you know, in 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 the modern world, thinking about what it would be like to live uh, in a town that is you know being you know put under siege by by an angry mob. He, he, I've gotten to really explore a lot of emotions with him as a 20 year old. And then again, as a, as a 40 year old, yeah. I, yeah, I feel yeah, now, like that now that you're a property owner in Boston, you probably look at this much differently. Right. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely do. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, for, uh, we haven't mentioned yet, but I was a student of, of yours years and years ago. Uh, uh and it was always a, a loud mouth radical in your class. And, uh, you always you always said you'd 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 win me over, and I'd I'd, I'd, I'd come on, I'd, I'd calm down as I got older, and, and you were right. <laughs> well, you know, I, when I was your age, then I was also a loudmouth radical, so I kind of know how things often go. So it's good. anyway, um, you've also, by the way, in addition to doing interpretation and doing these exhibits, you also created a couple of comic series, or I guess they're called graphic novels. So free hands. Oh, I call them comics. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's a crazy rebranding. It's it's it, comics aren't embarrassing. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote a. I, I'm currently writing a, a pirate series based on the history of piracy in Boston called Free Hands, um, which uh, was really deeply influenced by uh, a class I actually took at Suffolk University with uh, with Stephen O'Neill uh, mm -hmm. on piracy. Uh, but I just got really got really interested in the relationship between um, a, a pirate named William Fly. Uh, who was executed yeah. in Boston in the early 18th century, uh, and Cotton Mather, who is a you know a, a prominent preacher here in Boston and also, also in Salem, involved in the Salem witch trials, yeah. uh, uh, seemed to get a taste for executing pirates when he came back to Boston in the early 18th mm -hmm. century. Uh, and William Fly uh, is this fascinating character at the the end, the very end of the golden age of piracy. Uh, who appears to get on a ship in one of the Carolinas uh, and then oversee a mutiny uh, and take over this this ship and, and break all of the rules, mm. the accepted rules of piracy. Um, you know, uh, pirates at their core, uh, in their most idealistic versions, uh, in, as seen by people like Black Bart Roberts, have these like codes, right? There are pirate mm -hmm. codes and there's rules yeah. because these men are trying to be free in an oppressive mm -hmm. world. And yeah. one of those rules is, you know, you don't, you don't uh you don't impress sailors uh because the mm -hmm. idea is that sailor, pirates are free uh one of one of those uh, the other reasons for that though is a practical one uh some sailors particularly ones with specific skills like navigators uh can really put you in, in a in a bad place if they're yeah, not yeah. um if they're not there of their own free will and uh fly impresses a navigator who brings him into boston oh. harbor uh, and subsequently, oh. his entire crew is is executed for piracy. Uh, but Fly refuses to repent uh, in in um, when he's dragged in front of uh, mm. um, uh, Mather's congregation. And so this kind of dance between the two of them mm. goes on for months, where Fly refuses to repent, so his soul isn't saved, and so he can't be executed. Uh, and then finally, there's this really kind of public, really high high public event execution. Uh, where Fly is finally executed and makes this this really fun and brilliant pirate speech, uh, where he says that the, his only regret is that he doesn't have more time to kill more Captain Greens. Captain Green is his, his captain, and uh, more Cotton Mathers, uh, and then he wow. and then he gets hanged. Uh, and my wow. understanding is, is it's the last time that Cotton Mather oversees a pirate execution. But the, that story just lends itself to kind of a uh, an almost yeah. usual suspect uh crime mystery. And so I've, yeah. I've created a crime mystery to tell that story. That's great. And how many issues are there? Uh, uh, currently, uh, the second one is actually on its way out um, this month. And then the next one will be crowdfunded in uh, uh, probably in January or February. Um, but you can check out stuff, uh, updates for that at sequentialdecay.com, which is the publisher. Okay, okay very good, sequentialdecay.com. 
And you, uh, no, do you do the illustrations or do you have? Um, no, I'm uh, useless in that regard. I'm purely a writer. Uh, the art is done by a, a gentleman named Matt Rowe, who is a, actually a Canadian uh, illustrator uh, who I've been working with for a number of years. He and I did uh, a book called Nightmare Man uh, a long time ago, which was based mm -hmm. on a um, kind of urban legend uh, about a, a, a guy who abducted children, tried to abduct children uh, mm. when I was a, when I was a kid in the '90s, uh, and we also did a short story um, called Little Things, uh, which mm -hmm. was about another urban legend uh, about a man who was released from an insane asylum in the Massachusetts suburbs in the 1990s. Um, oh. Because Massachusetts in the 1990s is full of great spooky myths uh, about yeah. people yeah. coming for your children. <laughs> It is, yeah. And, and I think, you know, you were also then dealing with a lot of these myths of the time of the revolution, the age of piracy. I mean, there's these great stories we have. And so is it a temptation for you as a historical interpreter to embellish or to share the urban legend and say, well, this is what people used to think? Or are you yeah. sure this? No, I think I think there's always the temptation, right? Then the, the, I think that's really the difference between the work I did as a tour guide and the work I do now in a museum, uh, tour guides in a lot of ways are it's a show, right? You're you're yeah. you're selling an experience that for yeah. people who are mostly on vacation, you know, if you've got a school group, mm -hmm. it's kind of a different thing. But um, people are looking to have fun, and so you know you can you can throw some qualifiers in and, and, and embellish mm -hmm. some stories. Uh, certainly, you know, the story of Cotton Mather and William Fly has been embellished by many, many people mm -hmm. uh, yeah. over the years. Uh, when I'm in, when I'm doing museum work, I try to, you know, stick to sources and, and not, mm -hmm. not try to, not, not put too much of a spin, uh, a spin on things. Um, but balancing between them, honestly, is why I think I end up gravitating towards um, the two different fields and, and not being yeah. able to stick in one of them. It's because, you know, sometimes right. you want to explore and have fun. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, in a lot of ways, honestly, I feel like I learned that from you, that like really? telling a story is important um, and, you know, get, getting the hooks in people to care about mm -hmm. history. The, the, the way I the way I started caring about history as a young person wasn't, you know, a history class. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that I, you know, read about reconstruction in eighth yeah. grade and was like, well, I got to know more about this. It was, it was reading, actually, it was reading comic books. It was reading uh, Frank yeah. Miller's 300, uh, which is about mm -hmm. the Battle of Thermopylae and uh, reading Torso by, I believe it was uh, Brian Michael Bendis, which is about the Torso mm -hmm. murders in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's historic pieces of historical fiction or historical reinterpretation through graphic art. Uh, and then playing video games like you know, Age of Empires and Civilization. Mm -hmm. And the starting point of a hook that has a basis in history is, in my experience, how most people start caring about this stuff. And then if they want to know more, they, they get into the weeds. But there's nothing right. wrong with with starting with the Killer Angels or you right. know, John Adams by, by um, uh, David uh, McCullough. Thank you, David McCullough. McCullough. Um, I'm sorry? McCullough, yeah. Yes, Dave McCullough. Or, you know, the John Adams miniseries on HBO, which yeah. is based on that book. Uh, or, yeah. you know, getting obsessed with Oppenheimer after you saw the Oppenheimer movie. Yeah. Uh, or Assassin's Creed, uh, which you right. know, goes through this building. You can walk around that's this right. building yeah. in Assassin's Creed. Yeah. yeah. You know, there is, I mean, th I think that's true, that we have these hooks or these things that can get people engaged in the story in a lot of different ways. And then, mm -hmm. you know, it's up to them. I mean, I... I could give a lecture about the revolution, but actually engaging someone on that level is actually a much lot more valuable uh, or a lot more um, visual. I mean, if you're at revolutionary spaces, you actually have the opportunity to be in the place where these debates, have, discussions happened at Old South Meeting House. I mean, you're in this space. And I know that you've been using these uh, for dramatic presentations of things. Um, yeah, in your yeah, we actually have a play running right now called Phyllis in Boston, which is, is getting great reviews and it's, it's a yeah. fantastic show uh, that's being, being uh, it's in Old South Meeting House. Uh, it's yeah. running through December 3rd. Uh, and it yeah. tells the story of Phyllis Wheatley, who was a member uh, of the Old South Meeting House uh, back in the 18th century. She was an enslaved woman who wrote the first published uh, collection of poetry by a black woman in America. And as it happens, just a fascinating coincidence, uh, the, the, edition, the first edition of her book arrives in Boston on the Dartmouth in November right. of 1773 yeah. alongside the tea. And so she has this actual economic and social interest in this ship that is in the midst oh, yeah. of this crisis. So it's a great story. 
Uh, and it's, it's, I think, the fourth or fifth play uh, the organization has done, if you include the Bostonian Society days. Um, yeah, we did Blood in the Snow, which, which activated yes. the, yeah. um, the, the council chamber at Old State House right. in the aftermath of the Boston, Boston Massacre. Yeah. Uh, we utilized uh, a door that was owned by John yeah. Hancock uh, on his house for Cato and Dolly. Uh, we did the petition, which was about uh, slave, uh, anti-slavery petitions uh, and emancipation mm -hmm. petitions. There, there's been really great uh, again, great embellishments that tell a story better than than uh, than just the just the raw documents yeah. sometimes yeah. do. Yeah. I, had, I had a teacher yeah. once who uh, who, who said uh, about um, uh, Arabian Nights, and it always stuck with me. I learned more uh, I learned more about uh, the, uh, the Middle East reading Arabian Nights than I did to, uh, spending two years in the Middle East, uh, yeah. and that always stuck with me. Uh, it wasn't that it wasn't important to go there, but he probably wouldn't have gone there if it wasn't for, for reading That's around. True. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And so the Phyllis in Boston plays by Ade Solanke, who's a playwright based in London. And Fantastic playwright. Yeah. And she, she did another play called Phyllis in London uh, mm -hmm. that caught our eye. And so we, we commissioned her for an original play. And so the world premiere was a couple of weeks ago right here at Old South Meeting House. I, I can't emphasize enough that folks should come to that play. Um, it's it's on weekends, including on on Thanksgiving weekend, but it's also on Wednesday and Thursday nights. Um, it's it's a fantastic play. We also have uh, two school day, uh, school day um, uh, matinees. Uh, the first one I believe is sold out, and it's tomorrow. But we have another one on the twenty eighth. So if you have students who want to go, uh, you can contact us Great. Uh, to, Great. to bring your class. Great. We're talking with Matt Wilding, who's the Director of Education and Interpretation at Revolutionary Spaces, and also, as you can probably tell by now, an accomplished teller of stories, historian of Boston and the Revolution and other things. And I mean, you have had an interesting career where you've worked at, uh, you know, you've done consulting work for the Ronald Reagan Library and the Ted Kennedy Institute, you know, Ted Kennedy, of course, Senator from Massachusetts. But you dealt with people from a wide range of, you know, political persuasion, a wide range of uh, points on the political spectrum. I wonder how that how that informs what you do when you're putting an exhibit together. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it's it's the most fun about this work, actually. Uh, it was really strange having you know worked at the Ted Kennedy Institute uh, for four and a half years and then getting picked up by the Reagan. Uh, there actually is less difference than I think most people would think. Mm -hmm. uh, most educators and most museum professionals uh, don't really don't don't let political agendas get into their work uh, too much. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know we still get accused of it no matter <laughs> no matter what we sure. do. Uh, but you know I, I don't think I, t I don't think my approach changed dramatically writing programming for the Kennedy and writing programming mm -hmm. for the Reagan. Um, I, so for context, at the Kennedy Institute, I, I worked on a game uh, called the Set Immersion Module, uh, which was a two and a half hour immersive experience for up to 100 students uh, to create legislation. Uh, you know, we worked with both Democratic and Republican Senate offices to create that program. Uh, and then we also did historical theater pieces uh, called Great Senate Debates. Um, at the Reagan, I worked on a, a revamping of their immersive education program on, on presidential leadership at uh, the Discovery Center, and we built it on a historical event, uh, the downing of KAL-007, uh, which was a Korean airline that appears to have been shot down by the Soviet Union. Um, and then I got to actually, I got to make another game uh, here at the um, I, uh, I, here at the Ed Revolutionary Spaces of the Old South Meeting House that is also built around the aftermath of the Boston Tea Party. Uh, and I think getting to do work at the Kennedy and at the Reagan really primed me to be able to do a game here where we we, we made sure to write perspective, the differing political perspectives in the 18th century. Uh, and we included a really broad base of people who aren't usually included. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, both free and enslaved black folks, women, but also mm -hmm. uh, for me, most importantly, British subjects in Britain, uh, because the right. perspective yep. on, on the Boston Tea Party by rank and file people in, in England is actually a really important uh, mm -hmm. worldview that we never talk about yeah. in the States. Right, right. Uh, yeah. and, I th and honestly, I, I genuinely think that that came from getting to actually sit down with, you know, like John McCain's office when I was, when I was in mm -hmm. my, in my yeah. late twenties 
and have them, yeah. you know, spell out their point of view on on a you know, like immigration reform or, or the farm bill, right. uh, and then working yeah. with you know conservative Republican uh, historians at the at the Reagan and, and getting a point of view that I didn't necessarily see. So it's a learning yeah. process to answer your question. You know, like it is. It's, it is. Yeah. I don't I don't know everything about most of this stuff, and you know, I actually gravitated towards. Um, you know, a lot of conservative historians as a col in, in college, both in undergrad and grad school, despite my mm -hmm. uh, my my more liberal leanings uh, as a, as an mm -hmm. individual, because you know they 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 give perspective, right? They they make right. us think about things in in ways we don't necessarily think about them. And what is the study of history if not to just think about things a little bit differently? Right. Yeah, I think one of the most valuable lessons we learn is that we don't know everything. Yeah, you know, I'm still working on admitting that to myself, but. <laughs> <laughs> Well, take it from me. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, we, we, we've been talking with Matt Wilding, who is the Director of Education and Interpretation at Revolutionary Spaces. I know we could go on all day, but I know you actually do have two museums to oversee and other I things do. to do. Yeah. Anything else we should talk about that Rev Spaces is doing? Yeah, I just want to mention um, the the kind of grand finale for our year uh, is, of course, the reenactment of the Boston mm -hmm. Tea Party and, and uh, the meeting of the body of the people. The, um, the, the, the December 16th event has actually sold out, but we're actually doing another one uh, on the 15th, so the Friday okay. beforehand. And there's still a handful of tickets left for that. Uh, so if people want to come and um, celebrate the, or, and commemorate the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party with us, uh, I can't, I can't emphasize enough what a good time it is. I know you've, you've gone a couple of times. Uh, yeah, we want to tell us what it is. I mean, it's a, so, so this is, yeah. it is an, an immersive thing where you're participating in this meeting. Yeah. So we have, you know, colonial costumed people uh, really um, ultimately reenacting the meeting that leads to the Boston Tea Party uh, on December 16th, 1773. Uh, last year, we revamped the script a little and we uh, we added some characters who are not welcome in the meeting. Um, and yeah. I, I think we did it in a way that was uh, that didn't feel forced. You know, we clarify why it is they're there and why how they're not allowed in the meeting. Uh, we we made Phyllis Wheatley kind of the the voice of God narrator uh, throughout it because of her connection to both the books and the building. Um, but yeah, we get to you get to you get to really participate in the town meeting that leads to mm -hmm. one of the most important historical events in American history. And then at the, at the end, there are opportunities for people to speak out and, and take on other characters mm -hmm. uh, who were involved. And we had, we had a really good time with that last year. People got really mm -hmm. engaged in it. And then we'll march over to the Harbor and, and watch the folks right. at the Boston Tea Party ships dump the tea into the sea. Uh, so that, that event's great. incredible. It's been going on for years. Uh, yeah. One of Boston's great historical traditions. On the 14th, uh, we'll also have a civic event. Uh, we're we're going to be honoring some people for uh, for their civic work. Announcements are going to be going out about that this week. But uh, okay. that's going to be great, too. That's going to be free and open to the public. Wonderful. Very good. We've been talking with Matt Wilding, Director of Education and Interpretation at Revolutionary Spaces, a longtime Boston cultural leader, uh, veteran of our tourism public history world. Uh, it's been great talking to you, Matt. You as well. It was great to see you, Bob. Yes, thanks, thanks. And I want to thank Jonathan Lane, our producer, and our many listeners around the world. You know, Matt, when we started this, we thought, you know, a handful of our friends might tune in. But we have listeners, actually. So every week I thank people in different places. And if you're one of these places and want some of our Revolution 250 stuff, Jonathan has just made up a new batch of playing cards, other things. Uh, send him an email, jlane at revolution250.org. So this week, Riverside Park, New Jersey, Long Beach, California. Uh, Knoxville and Cordova in the state of Tennessee, and two of the W towns here in Massachusetts, Walpole and Weymouth, and Rishon Lezion in Israel. Thanks all for listening in all places beyond and between. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston.